Good morning, everybody. My name's Chad, uh, one of the pastors here. Sorry I have a cold. The good news is I'm pretty far from you, and so you probably won't get it. Um, but it's a joy to be together. Um, a joy to sing together. I'm standing back there in the corner. I kind of have my spot. I lean against the wall. I get goosebumps. Um, I love being together with the body of Christ to lift our voices, especially when we come in with all kinds of things going on. And so I want to pray for us. I want to pray for you. I want to ask that the Holy Spirit uh, will be working in our hearts. So let's pray. I want thank you for uh, this morning. Uh, Lord, as we lift our praises to heaven, God, you hear us because of Jesus. Lord, uh, you have made a way for us to be connected to you. And Lord, you've given us a path, easy access, Lord, as even we're going to hear about in, in a couple of few weeks, Lord, that, that you've opened the way that we're supposed to come boldly today, to not hold back. Lord, you are mighty to save this morning. You can move mountains. And so we ask God for whatever those are in our life, that you would do it in power. Lord, would your Holy Spirit be moving through this room? Would you be touching our hearts and our minds? Lord, if we are cold and calloused, if we feel like our heart is hard, Lord, if we are running, if we aren't anywhere near you, would we sense, Lord, that you are not repulsed, you are not running away from us, Lord, you are running to us this morning. You are coming after us. What a God you are. Would you speak through your word in Christ's name, amen. So it's impossible for me to read this book without looking at everything that's going on around me without looking at the world we live in, without looking at the things that are happening in our culture, without looking at my own kids and my wife, my family, the circumstances that are happening, it's impossible. And I find that almost every time I open the book, it's as if God is saying, here is a lens for today. Here is a way for you to see the world that you live in today. The passage for this week in Hebrews ran into life this week to the NFL. To this, this week, which is very precious to me. This was my grandfather's. Uh, he died a few years after World War II. But more precious to me than this of his is a New Testament that I have that he took with him. And I don't say this to make us feel weird or to do that weird, crazy thing that pastors do sometimes. When they're like, you can cheer at a football game, but you can't cheer for Jesus at work. They'd be like, don't be weird. Don't do that. <laughs> but what I do think is very interesting is that I have found my heart pulled in both directions to those who are choosing to protest and whether you agree it's the right place or not for what they're protesting for. And you may be like, well, but it's not real. They shouldn't do it there. They should do it somewhere else. But as I get through my flesh and I look underneath, I see people who are hurting and they're trying to stand up for other people who are hurting. And then I also see my grandfather and the fact and others that died for that flag. And so I find myself going, they both have a point. And I'm reading in Hebrews this week and I'm asking, Lord, what are we supposed to do? I don't think it's a coincidence that the most hot topic issues in our culture right now are finding themselves in our house of worship. And I don't mean this one, I mean the stadium. And we go there to worship, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. We are made to celebrate. We are made to go, that was an awesome hit. That pass, look at that, it's beautiful. We're made to, but don't you find it interesting that the things that are going like this and pounding at each other, where we're name calling and pointing back and forth is happening on the one stage and the one place where all of us usually look? We have to look at things that way as believers to be able to see this book and what God is doing and to say, God, what does it mean that it is happening there? For whatever you believe, because your job as a believer in Jesus, or if you're on the way to believing in Jesus, is to go past the stuff that's in the headlines. It's to go underneath, to see the people involved, to see that salvation and God's kingdom and whether we kneel or stand for Jesus is a whole lot more important than whether we kneel or stand for our national anthem and our flag. Though I do every time with my hand over my heart and I get choked up. I'm in both places, but I can't look at this book without thinking about those things this morning. I can't enter into God's words and that is what he wants. He doesn't want you just to read the Bible. He wants 
it to read you this morning. He wants to get into, in there to the details of your life. And there was a little church, if you're just joining us, we started, we're two weeks into Hebrews. There's a little church in Rome about 2,000 years ago, and they felt about this big. And they were discouraged, and they kind of wanted to give up. And so these first few chapters were a way to say, don't give up. And he said, God is speaking. God has been speaking. He has spoken, and he has said one thing. It's Jesus. And we say, yeah, but I need more answers than that. And he's like, no, what you need is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as Daniel told us last week, we have to pay attention to what he's saying. We have to line our hearts up with him to say, my allegiance is either with you or what else? To ask those questions. They were wondering how to navigate the issues of their day. So are we. So are we. And so I want to encourage you this morning to ask the question, why did it have to be Jesus? Why Jesus? Because that's what the world would say. Why do we need him? Why Jesus, the son of God? And what do you say to someone or to yourself when you feel like giving up, when you want to walk away from Jesus? And I mean the hard things about Jesus. I mean the controversial things about Jesus, like he's the only way to heaven. Those things, when you want to give in to culture, when you want it to be a little easier, when you feel the sting of the world and the corruption of power pressing in on you, and you ask a question like this, is this all there is? Is this it? What do we have after this? Is heaven going to be one big, long church service? I sure hope not. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I love being in this. I love listening to somebody teach. I love worship. But I also love the beach and the waves crashing and putting my toes in the sand and that weird feeling that feels like it's taking you down and under and hanging out with my family and laughing on the front porch till our bellies hurt and good food. Oh my goodness, I love good food. And so I start thinking about these things and like these are things that God's given us and are these things a part of our future or are we just gonna be like, oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Welcome to heaven, you made it. <laughs> and we're like, man, is anybody playing football up here or anything? <laughs> we want to know, is there anything more than this? Is there something that's worth it? Will he be worth it? Will he be worth it? And the writer of Hebrews says, oh, man, let me tell you something. So if you have a Bible... If you want to grab the one in front of you, it's page 1001. We're in Hebrews 2, verse 5. You can also look on your app. You can look on your neighbor's app. You could take a nap. <laughs> but I think it's important what we're going to hear. Here's what he says in verse 5. It'll also be on the screen if you just want to take it in. Speaking of the future, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. And I want you to dial, dial in on that word, the world to come. It has been testified somewhere, which really makes me feel good that this guy said somewhere. I don't know. Like, because that's how I feel sometimes, not Joe. Joe knows exactly where it is. He knows the address. I'm like, man, somewhere in the Bible, maybe in the book of hesitations, it says <laughs> something. So I love that the writer was like, it says somewhere. What is man? Who are we that you even think about us, God? We're so small. Or the son of man, which is a way to say human being, okay? It's a way to say human being, and it's a both and passage, okay? So it's going to be one of those double meanings. Or the son of man that you even care for him. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Say, what? Really? Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. But at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, to which we would all say, no kidding. No kidding. What do you say to those people who are struggling, who wonder, is it worth it? You say, folks, this life is just the dress rehearsal. It's just the dress rehearsal. There's a friend of mine, his dad, who just went to be with Jesus a couple of weeks ago, said, this is the job interview. This is the job interview. 
He even had this cool illustration where he stretched out this rope that was, you know, 100 feet long, and he had a piece of tape that was like from the beginning to about six inches in. He said, this is your life on earth. That is eternity. This is just the dress rehearsal. What will it be like in the world to come? The kingdom of God? Who's doing what when we get there? This tiny church feels the oppressive rule of Rome and those who don't like that they like Jesus and they kind of want to give up. How about you? So the writer draws on a couple of Old Testament passages. And this is what's really cool about this writer in Hebrews is that he knows the Old Testament. And he's bringing it in and he's showing you how it connects to Jesus. If you ever thought the Old Testament is old, it doesn't really have anything to do. And that was God's like, you know, 1.0. And he was like, oh man, that was horrible. Let's wait 400 years and do 2.0 and it'll be better. That's not it. From beginning to end, it speaks of Jesus. And so he brings in Psalm 8 and he says, what is man that you are mindful of him? What are we that you even think of us? The son of man, which is a way to say human being. And that's how all people who read that psalm forever would have thought of it until Jesus came along and he kept calling himself something over and over and over again. Son of man, the human being of human beings, the son of man. And it's a direct reference to Genesis when he starts talking about all this stuff of things being subject to you. And you're like, that's not very inspiring. Being in charge, things being under your control, to which that still isn't very inspiring. To rule over everything. That's, that was the charge in the garden. Here you go. I made this for you. Take care of it. To which we kind of immediately think Adam and Eve are kind of like getting on their knees and, you know, <laughs> put a little flower there and trim a little tree here. No. Everything. Our son is one of a hundred thousand million sons just in our galaxy. Our galaxy is one of a hundred thousand million galaxies in the universe. And God says, you're in charge. To which I'm like, okay, Pluto, <laughs> stay there. <laughs> we're sorry about the whole planet confusion thing. We know you were a planet for a while, but stay there. Uranus, we're sorry about the name thing that we made that mistake all those years in school. It's, it's Uranus now. Nobody's making fun of you anymore. <laughs> Rule and reign over the universe. How do we do that? Well, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't do well. We blew it. How do we know that? Have you ever wondered this? And I heard this in a sermon a couple weeks ago, and I, it was one of those. I was in my office, and I like turned it off, and I said, shut up to myself and to the spirit. I was like, you got to be kidding me. He asked this question, have you ever wondered why Satan was in the garden at all? Early Christian teaching said this, he was there to be judged. What were Adam and Eve supposed to do? It wasn't like some cruel trick. Let's see what can happen if we throw in a demon. It was, you are to be judged and then what? Kicked out, expelled. Oops. We didn't do it. You are to be in charge of everything. And it wasn't, hey, take care of the flowers. Won't this be great in heaven? We'll all have little gardens. No, to rule and reign, to something that is connected to God's glory and to who he is, we're supposed to be reigning with him. So God, if this is the dress rehearsal, I think we need some more rehearsal time because I forgot my lines already. I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what that would look like to even reign with you. You were crowned with glory and honor. So again, it's a psalm about humans and it's a psalm about the Messiah. If there's anything you get this morning, I want you to get this. Your future must be connected to Jesus. Amen. It must be connected to Jesus. He came and our, we were crowned with glory and honor. We said, let's rule and reign, do it. And you know what we did? We said, eh, boosh. I'll throw that crown down. I'd rather be like God. I'd rather disobey. Jesus comes as the true son of Adam, the son of man, and he picks up our crown 
and he is intent on winning back your heart. Your eternal future must be connected to Jesus. And he says this in other places in the New Testament, which means we can't ignore it. In Matthew 20, the mother of James and John went up to Jesus and said, hey, go to favor. She's got some chutzpah, okay, this lady. She's, she's got some stuff. When she goes up, she goes, grant that my sons can sit on your right and your left in your kingdom. Jesus doesn't say, how dare you? He says, well, can they share in what I will share in, the suffering? And she said, yes. And he said, actually, that's true, they will. And they would all be killed for following Jesus. She said, but that decision, God said, but that decision is up to my father. First Corinthians 6, do you not know that you will judge angels? That's a verse. Revelation 3, to the one who endures to the end, I will let him sit with me on my throne and rule and reign. What does that mean? We were having preaching prep this week, and it was really good because James uh, Reynolds, who I love James. My kids are coming home so excited about the Bible because of James. He said, I don't really know what that means, and that, therefore, I'm not really that excited about it. And so we kind of had this little back and forth, but I sat with that for two days, and it helped me get to this place to realize, I don't really know what that means either. What does that mean, God, to rule and to reign with you? I'm going to give you one taste. What does a judge do? A good judge has the life of another person in their hands, don't they? They can decide life or death, prison or freedom. They make decisions on behalf of people. There's a church in Brooklyn, New York called the Brooklyn Tabernacle. They have an awesome choir, gospel choir. And this woman had a husband who was addicted to cocaine and he was on the streets at the very moment that they were having a prayer meeting. And the whole church has gathered, and his name was Calvin, and they were praying for Calvin on their faces, lifting their hands, Lord, bring him home. Bring him home. Make the things that he's pursuing so repulsive to him. Let him seek you. Let him come here. It's like 30, 40 minutes. They're going on and on. They're singing. They're praying for Calvin. Lord, bring him, bring him, bring him. And he was on the streets at that very moment looking for his next hit. All of a sudden, the doors in the back open up, and the pastor, Jim Symbolist, said, and here he is. And Calvin walks down the middle of the aisle. He gets on his face. He's weeping, and he says, I want to be home. Okay, that's better than a little gardening for me. And so I don't know what it'll be look like in heaven, but I know that that's what he says, you've been given the power of life and death in your life when you know Jesus. And if there's somebody that doesn't know him, guess what? The dress rehearsal means you start trying to get people to know that there's life and there's freedom in Jesus. But the author says, but we don't see everything yet, to which we all say, amen, that's true. We don't, not even close. What can we see then? Look in verse nine. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. We do not see everything under his control, but we do see Jesus. We do see Jesus. So do you? Do you see him? Do you see specifically the suffering Savior? A suffering God was very offensive to that culture. Guess what? A suffering God is very offensive to this culture. They don't like it, and honestly, neither do you. If we get right down to it, why did God's son have to suffer? Couldn't he just say it like creation? Be saved, all done, just the way he did Pluto, planets, stars, earth, saved. The reason is because in our religion, we couldn't do it. God had to act. 
He had to act. Here's the key to the gospel. If you're wondering to know what is the, what is the essential truth of the gospel, it's this. You can't. You can't do it. And it's the cross of Christ. I heard a pastor this past week say, that is the tip of the sword. The cross of Christ, and it will offend every time. And it's the one thing that we want to get rid of in culture. It's the one thing that is so offensive. The scandal, Jesus even said it, it's a scandal on a scandal, but it's the only way to see Christ. So not just looking at him and saying, oh, he was a good person and I want to be love, loving and kind to everyone. I'm kind. I'm good. Isn't that enough? No. Jesus says it will never be enough. It's only through the cross. But we like strength, power, and beauty. Look at our culture. What do we worship? People who can catch the ball with one hand, who can own it on the court. Movie stars and stories told well that bring tears to our eyes. And then we get excited about seeing them in culture. And then when one of them says something important, we're like, ooh, so-and-so said this about this. And the absurdity that we think that or they could give us wisdom for our souls, that they could answer the deep questions of the heart. This little church, our church, we're tempted to follow those ways. Because what they have in front of them, the mighty Roman Empire and Caesar, power and authority and strength and they were being persecuted for following this guy from Jerusalem who was dead, trying to live up to it, and they wanted to go back. But by the grace of God, Jesus was committed to creating you and to saving you. For he is the one, and he says this in verse 10, for whom and by whom all things exist. So your life belongs to him. It was made by him. It exists for him. It's his. Therefore, it makes sense that he's the only one that can fix it. We do see Jesus and he's the only one. That's what he's saying. You exist because of him. You exist for him. You can only be saved and redeemed by him. But it gets better. He doesn't just want to save you. Look at verse 11. He who sanctifies those who sanctified all have one source. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. He doesn't want to just want to save you. He wants you as his family. He wants you to be able to say, Jesus, my older brother, my family, my older brother is coming to get me. I'm drowning. I'm dying in my sin. And my older brother is coming to get me. It's bigger than just, oh, you're so dirty and you're so awful and God wants to destroy you. And the only way for you not to be destroyed is for you to accept this thing that Jesus has done. And then fine, you can come to heaven and tend your garden. Yay. No, he says, my son, my daughter, my brother, my sister, family. The same source is just him saying they have the same father. We have the same father. And the father said to the son, go get your family back. Go get your family back. I'm sending you on mission. It reminds me of that movie Taken with Liam Neeson when his daughter gets taken and he gets on the phone with the bad guys and he says, I have a particular set of skills <laughs> and I'm coming to use them on you. I'm coming to get her and I'm going to get her back and I'm going to hurt you. <laughs> That's pretty much what he says. That's what it makes me think of. Jesus looks at death and he says, I am coming to get my family back. I don't want them just to say, oh, thank you not for, for not killing me, God. I want the embrace that says, brother, faithful older brother, not the one who stayed at the party and got mad when the younger one came home. The duty of the older brother in the story of the prodigal son was to go get the younger son. That was his duty. He didn't do it. Jesus is the faithful older brother who says, you ran away? I'm coming to get you. I'm coming after you. And how does he do this? He says, I'm going to sing. 
what? I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing a song of eternity. I will tell of your name to my brothers. Guess where that comes from? Psalm 22, which also has a few other familiar phrases. They have pierced my hands and feet. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. But I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing. You who fear the Lord, praise him, glorify him, stand in awe of him. He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. The ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation shall worship before you. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. I love this. And even the one who could not keep himself alive. I think that's all of us. It shall be told to the coming generation, the Lord has done it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me is also in that psalm. And we know that Jesus said that on the cross. Most scholars think he quoted the whole psalm. Psalm 22. From memory, he wrote it, so he knows it. But on the cross, how is he coming to get you? How is he making you a part of his family again? Where is he saying, I will sing of your name to my brothers? Like, think about what he was saying, proclaiming, all the earth will come and bow down. They will worship and they will say, the Lord has done it on the cross. On the cross, he's speaking these words, and the writer of Hebrews is going, don't you see? Don't you see? The world looks at this and says, I don't get it. I don't need it. It's admirable that Jesus died for a good cause. But I don't know. But if we have eyes to see our spiritual condition, the depth of the fall and of sin and death in our own hearts, we will know that this song, sung on a hill outside the city of Jerusalem, was for us. And we will say, I need my older brother to rescue me. He finishes with beautiful words that show God's understanding of our hearts. And this is the cool thing about God. He doesn't just save. He doesn't say, yeah, you're part of the family, but you better behave because you really did bad things. And so you know, sit over there. He says, I'm going to take it even further. I'm going to take it even further. Look at verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, which is another way to say, because we were human beings, he became a human being. Okay. Sometimes the ESV gets a little wonky. So because he was a human being, we were human beings. He became a human being that through death he might destroy, destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, here it is, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Eugene Peterson says he had to get into all the details of what it means to be a human being, all the details, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, which is a way to say he had to make a sacrifice that would appease the wrath of God, because God, if he's a good God and he's a just God, he must have sin paid for. Otherwise, he's not good. And he's not just. And so the propitiation is a sacrifice that says, okay, something, someone has died for those sins. To make propitiation for the sins of the people, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. You know, with all of our technological advances, with science, we have cured diseases. We've come up with awesome drugs that all of us rely on now, penicillin. I mean, there are things that killed people a long time ago that don't kill people anymore because we have smart people doing good work. We went to the moon. Think about that. We went to the moon 
so inspiring. Other things that we're doing, we're seeing all kinds of wonderful technological advances. We're getting it, we're growing, we're expanding. It's wonderful stuff. But there's one thing we can't figure out yet. And we're scared of it. We're scared to death of death. Think about it. Even with all the stuff, everybody stops and freezes in their tracks when they lose somebody or when they find out they have something in them that's going to take their life eventually. All of a sudden, everything changes. Jesus came to punch death in the face. And he had to be a human being. He had to have a human heart to save the human heart. And it had to be a good one because you needed a heart transplant. Yours was corrupted and you needed a pure one and you needed Jesus to give you that. Our brokenness and need as human beings required a broken, suffering savior. Tim Keller said it this way, he lived the life you should have lived and died the death you should have died. That's the gospel. He lived the life you should have lived and died the death you should have died. But this is what's cool. He didn't from on high send a lightning bolt down to destroy death. I was listening to my home pastor, John Wood in Knoxville, Tennessee, and he was quoting somebody else, one of his buddies, who said it was an inside job. He went inside and he kicked down the death door from the inside. He kicked it down from the inside. He got in there. Why did he have to do that? What's so wrong with the heart of man? And this is one of the other things that you might hear, you might be thinking, aren't we pretty good? I mean, haven't we come a long way? Don't we watch those videos on Facebook of people caring for the less, the, le the least of these, and we get tears in our eyes, most of us? Yeah, we do. It's common grace that's causing that to happen. It's Jesus even giving us the ability. But the heart of man is corrupt, and that's what we know in the scriptures. There are two books, one called Ordinary Men and one called Hitler's Willing Executioners. Many of us think World War II, Auschwitz, the killing of six million Jews happened because of the SS and those bad, evil, demonic people with skull, you know, the skull on their helmets, and they were the ones. You look at history, actually, it was ordinary Germans who did most of the killing. Definitely hesitant at first, but eventually they did it without even a thought. The point being, we're all capable. We're all capable. Jeremiah 17, nine says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jesus says, me. And he finishes the verse with, I, the Lord, Search the heart and test the mind. Jesus says, I can. And in your life, I must. I must. Psalm 51, David says, surely I was born in sin. I was conceived in sin. I was born bent to do the wrong thing. And the only one that can help me is Christ. The only way I can be saved. And I love how he finishes it here because he himself has suffered when tempted. Here it is, folks. He is able to help you, to help. That is what our God does this morning. He only asks, and this is important because sometimes you read stuff and if you're a very practical person, we were talking about this in preaching prep too, you're like, okay, give me the one, two, three. What am I supposed to do? You know what you're supposed to do when you hear these things? that Jesus is your older brother, that we can see him, that this life is just a dress rehearsal, and that we're wondering, how are we gonna make it? How are we gonna get there? We're scared to death of death. You see Jesus coming for you, and you, your response is to be, I believe, <laughs> help my unbelief. I believe, I worship you, Lord, I worship you. I'm gonna have the worship team come, and we're gonna come to the table together. There's no better place to think about Jesus coming as God and man than the table where he would say to the disciples, this is for you and this is what I'm about to do. And I wanna invite you, if you have said yes 
to the sacrifice of Jesus, if you've accepted him into your life as the substitution, that propitiation word, you know you need it. Join us. If you haven't, don't feel weird. Don't feel like you gotta leave. But be asking, Lord, are you, are you inviting me to the table? Are you wanting me to pursue you? I encourage you, if, if he is tapping on your heart, to come forward. We're going to have some people up here that would love to pray with you. Um, just let the song kind of spill over your heart as we sing, um, as we take communion together. Lord, thank you for the table. Thank you for your words in Hebrews. Um, God, may they move in us in power. And God, would you meet us now as we partake of the sacrament of communion together.